It's a actually it's a cold winter morning, and Kim and her friends and her young cousin Meredith are down by the strait between her island and the mainland, and something unexpected appears. There's someone on the water, Tessa said. She pointed to the opposite shore. A small boat was pulling away from the mainland harbor. It veered a little north, then a little south, as if the driver wasn't used to handling it, but it was headed toward the island. Tessa's parents, I thought. Drew, someone from the government, finally. Hey, I shouted, even though there was no way anyone could have heard me at that distance, and waved my arm. Meredith spun around. As soon as she spotted the boat, she started jumping up and down, waving eagerly. Come over here! They'll go to the harbor where they can dock the boat, Mare, I said. As the boat drew closer, I saw it was a speedboat with no cabin, just a wide glass windshield and a lone figure behind it. My initial excitement dampened. It could be anyone. It could be a mainlander hoping our isolated town would make for easy pickings. Maybe that isn't someone we want on the island, Leo said, echoing my thoughts. We could meet them at the harbor, be ready in case they try something, Gav said, and then paused. Except I think they are coming this way. The boat was bobbing on the waves, but it definitely turned away from the harbor toward us. I eased closer to Meredith, resting my hand on her shoulder. After a few minutes, I could make out the man driving well enough to tell I didn't recognize him. He took his hands off the wheel to wave both his arms at us, the way Meredith had. But he looked more frantic than happy. As the boat approached the shore, Gav stepped to the water's edge. Everything all right? He called. The man who the boat is close to us is the shallower water as the shallower water allowed. His face looked pale and thin, engulfed by the padded hood of his coat. You have to get out of there, he hollered, cutting the engine. Tell everyone, you have to get off the island. What? I said, why? He might not have even heard me. They'll be here any minute, he said. They want to destroy the whole town. The breeze brought a faint sound in my ears, the choppy rumble of a helicopter in flight. We hadn't seen a food drop or a news truck or in ages. I made it a small, dark shape in the northern sky, and when I glanced back at the man in the boat, my pulse stuttered. He was looking at the shape, too, and his expression was like that of a mouse in the shadow of a hawk. Pure, undeniable terror. Whatever he was talking about, he obviously believed the danger was real. Who's coming, I said. What are they going to do? But my words were lost as the boat's engine roared. I'll meet you at the harbor for anyone who doesn't have a boat, the man yelled, reaching for the wheel. Hurry! Hold on, Gav shouted. The boat turned toward the docks and spread, sped away. Do you think we should listen to him, Tessa asked. He could be in the hallucinating stage of the virus, I said, but I'd never seen anyone that sick who'd still be capable of handling a boat. My heart started to thump. Maybe we should do what he said, just in case. I can swim by the hospital and tell them something's up, Gav said. I'll go with you, I said. Tessa, Leo, can you get Meredith to the harbor? We'll meet you there. Tessa nodded, grabbing Meredith's hand. I skipped up the ferrets, let them leap through the back door, and closed it behind them before hurrying after Gav. He had hopped into the SUV. The growl of the helicopter's engine was getting louder. What do you think's going on, I said as I scrambled into the passenger seat. Gav at the gas. I don't know. Let's hope he's just a lunatic. I hugged myself as we followed Tessa's tire tracks through the thick layer of snow on the road. Her car vanished around a turn up ahead. We were just rounding a corner halfway to the hospital when the shadow of the helicopter slid by overhead. A second later, the block of houses next to us exploded. Ooh.